Hi, and welcome to Take Every Thought Captive, our weekly look at the Catholic intellectual tradition and an exploration of the authors, books, and topics that have shaped Catholic thinking for 2,000 years. My name is Jason Gale, and before we get started today, I want to invite all of our listeners uh, to go over to catholicstudiesacademy.com and check out our back-to-school sale that we're having. Uh, you have, we're offering two ways to save with us. Uh, there's a coupon code that you can use to save 50% off of purchasing our courses. So you can purchase our courses outright, and you'll have access to those courses uh, for your life. Um, and right now, we just launched our philosophy bundle and our theology bundle. And what those are is that it gives you four philosophy classes, so kind of that first-year philosophy that we've rolled out here, and also our first-year theology courses. So you can buy those in a bundle, and right now when you purchase those, you can save 50% off. The other option we're offering is for our subscribers. And what we're offering for them is seven days of free courses. So you sign up, and for seven days, you'll get a free trial uh, to, to see what, what's being offered at Catholic Studies Academy. So you can check out the courses, uh, fundamental, uh, fundamental Theology, uh, you can check out the, the philosophy courses, Introduction to Philosophy, and all of the other content that comes with those courses, the forum um, where our professors are there answering questions. And also, um, uh, you'll get, like I said, you'll get seven days for free. Um, and then after that, uh, you, can, you can become a subscriber and continue your uh, learning of theology and philosophy. And we think it's uh, very important. And we think it's also one of those things where uh, we should follow the advice of St. Paul to be transformed by the renewal of our minds. And so um, go over to CatholicStudiesAcademy.com and check us out there. And the second thing we want to do is uh, also offer our listeners to this podcast an opportunity to weigh in on what we talk about. And so if, um, if everybody, uh, if you have something that uh, you'd like to, for us to discuss or anything like that, um, email us at info at catholicstudiesacademy.com and give us maybe a brief introduction of who you are and uh, what it is that you'd like us to talk about. And that could be most things. <laughs> I'll say that. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about most things in the philosophical and theological realm. Um, and, uh, uh, we'll see if we, um, if, if, you know, so, uh, email us at info at Catholic studies and, uh, we'll check it out and hopefully, uh, we'll discuss the topic that you suggest for us. All right. So today I'm joined by Dr. Benjamin Smith to discuss the topic of, uh, salvation. Um, but in particular, the, the, the contemporary idea, although it's not always that contemporary, uh, it's kind of recycled, um, about all, are all men saved? Um, and also, you know, can we have a reasonable hope that all men are saved? And it's something that's been in the, in the news and, and uh, blogs and things like that that people have responded to, uh, primarily because um, of, of the book, Dare We Hope That All Men Are Saved, by Hans Urs von Balthasar, who was a 20th century Swiss theologian uh, who is very influential with regards to Vatican II, uh, Cardinal Ratzinger, and kind of the, the, the new theology and the resource, the, the resource mon movement, which was going back to the sources. Um, and so uh, he, he has this book where, again, one thing I, would, I do want to remind our listeners before, because sometimes you may hear people condemn Balthazar just right out, say he's a universalist. Actually, Balthazar is doing theology. It's speculative. Uh, um, he's not, you know, proclaiming a universalist position, but he's speculating on uh, uh, on this issue that, you know, are all men saved? Is is hell empty? Can we have a, a reasonable hope that that's the case? And he, you know, has several hundred pages if you actually want to read it. So it's very hard to to, to condense his speech. Um, and um, in a short way, but but it's also become in the news again because of uh, uh, Bishop Robert Barron has has brought it up and finds it to be an interesting idea, um, you know. And I'll just say for our, for our catechists out there, uh, um, this is where some some real uh, distinction and some real uh, prudence needs to take place uh, because we shouldn't be bringing things from speculative speculative theology into actual catechesis. Um, 
and, and you know we can we can get into a lot of issues if we choose to do that. Uh, and so today, what we want to do is maybe look at this in a couple of different ways, um, but also look at you know what should our, our Christian disposition uh, be um, with regards to hell and the existence of souls in hell. Um, so, uh, Dr. Smith, maybe you can get us started uh, with with this uh, with this topic, and maybe begin with kind of the idea. You know, we'll start with probably the easiest one. So here's a here's a good softball. You know, are all men saved? <laughs> right, very good. Uh, my 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 short response would be probably not. Yeah. Um, so uh, and probably maybe even a little bit stronger than that. But at the very <laughs> least, I would say uh, probably not. Um, you know, Jason, this is a a topic that has a lot of um, practical implications. Yeah. I think, and I think that's one of the reasons that it's come to fore so much because it. If you shelve the question of, of kind of personal salvation, right? That mm-hmm. is, if it's basically like everybody's going to get in except for Hitler and Judas or something like that, then then basically, you know, the stakes are lowered and really what you're, what you're concerned with being saved from changes, right? Yeah. I think a lot changes in terms of, maybe not entirely, but to a great degree, you know, Christianity primarily then becomes about, well, your temporal happiness, right? Yeah. Um, rather than your eternal happiness, because that's pretty well secured. Um, so I think that there are a lot of uh, sort of uh, uh, implications with respect to apostolate, catechesis, evangelization, uh, that this turns on, and even maybe the way we preach, the way we couch the gospel, uh, all that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a, it's a, a topic of, uh, I think, enormous practical import. Um, I think a good thing to do is to begin with some baselines here and a clear question. So. If you were to put it this in scholastic terms, mm-hmm. you could ask the question whether all men are saved, uh, or you could even get maybe a, a smaller, a sort of lesser, uh, less sweeping question, whether most men are saved. Yeah. Uh, and for my own part, I'd want to answer negatively for both. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, the, the more, I guess the more relevant question is whether all men are saved. Um so let's just start with uh, some baselines uh, here, some baseline assumptions that, that all Catholics should hold. First and foremost, it's a dogma of the faith that hell is a real possibility. Uh, so th- that simply can't be ignored, right? That is, it's a real possibility. It is a reality. Um, it is something that um, even those who would say, I would say are a little bit soft on their eschatology would still want to say um, that, um, you know, it's po- it's a real possibility, right? Yeah. That uh, a soul could go to hell. So that's a that's a that that that's dogmatic. That can't be eliminated. That's part of the faith, right? Mm-hmm. Now we could have disputes about the nature of hell and the nature of the suffering or punishments that that's there. Um, we can just sort of set that aside. Maybe it's an important issue to be sure. I think, but um, set that that to the side. We do know it's an eternal state. Right. That's part of the dogma about it. That's very important. Because there were a few patristic uh, thinkers who who kind of turned hell into um, a law like a purgatory, you yeah. know, or a jail. Uh, yeah. yeah, right, right. And so that was condemned. Uh, and so our baseline needs to be a rejection of what I would call strong universalism, mm-hmm. right? So strong universalism would be the position that there is either that there is no such thing as hell, and that can go in a couple of different varieties. Or that eventually all will be saved, right? Yeah. Uh, necessarily, right? That it, that it can't be otherwise. That all will be saved. Logically, that's incompatible with the real possibility of hell, right? If if it's possible um, that um, some uh, go to hell, then it can't be the case that necessarily all go to heaven, <laughs> yeah. right? Do you, do you follow me? Yeah, right? yeah. Uh, so. Now that leaves aside the possibility, and von Balthasar and others will hold this that uh, that it will happen to turn out that all will make it into heaven, right? Yeah. Uh, and so that's the the kind of the the sort of walking sort of narrowly here, like the the fine edge of their position. Not that all necessarily will go to heaven, but that um, uh, uh, it, it it just will turn out that way, or that we can at least reasonably hope that it will turn out that way. So. Um, I would just so with those baselines in mind, and then the hypothesis uh, I think clarified. You know, I would say that I think there's a strong um, case to be made against this. That is, 
that it's not a reasonable hope. I guess is what I want to say. It's it's an unreasonable hope to think that all will be saved. Um, it's irrational. And the reason it's irrational is not because of, of a really a deductive necessity, but because of a rational improbability, right? That is, if you take yeah. all things considered that the church says, what the saints have said about this, yeah. I mean, the witness of the saints on this is just overwhelmingly sure. negative, right? Um, uh, in the negative. If you look at the uh, the witness of the saints, uh, the testimony of scripture, the way the saints have interpreted the scriptures, the uh, uh, the witness of the doctors of the church, and and also what what we know doctrinally, taken together cumulatively, right? I think what we have to say is that it's 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 imp- it's highly improbable to the vanishing point um, to say that we could uh, um, that all will be saved. Uh, let me just illustrate what I mean by that. It's it is it's it is uh, possible that I could swim across. Um, say uh, Old Hickory Lake or Percy Priest Lake, like it's a possibility, um, but I'd probably die. Yeah, you know, like, like, you know, like, I mean, it's it's not it's not logically or metaphysically impossible that I could swim across. Uh, maybe even the English Channel will go up the stakes here, right? <laughs> uh, but but the probability, I mean, like if I said, hey Jason, I'm gonna go to England uh, next week and I'm gonna swim across the he was sharing, right? Well, Ben, I got, uh, can you do that? And I'm like, well, demonstrate that it's logically impossible. <laughs> well, like, <laughs> you would rightly say, well, I, I mean, like, I, I don't know if I could demonstrate it, but like, are you trained? Are you like, yeah. a professional swimmer? Or, you know, it is it? Well, the answer is no. And so it's, it's, it's improbable to the vanishing point. And I think this yeah. is actually the question about probability and improbability in moral analysis and other things is actually more important than sometimes we, we give it credit. We tend to think, well, if it's not necessarily excluded, then it's permitted. And that's not necessarily the case, right? Uh, we should treat the probable as the probable and the improbable as the improbable. If you were to, to, sure. to select somebody who was, um, say, um, a promiscuous reprobate, right, to be your spouse, you could you might say, well, Ben, like, I mean, it's possible to work out. You know, I say, well, yeah, it's possible, right? But it's really unlikely and it's irrational for you to act on that, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, if it's it's possible that my child will be Catholic if I never take them to Mass, you know, is it probable? (laughs) (laughs) You know, right. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, and again, yeah, possible, yes, probable, no. And that, and the probability, aspect that you're bringing up is what really reduces the reasonable hope that's you know right. can you have an emotional hope that all men are saved yeah and and yeah. and i think that's what that's not I, theological that's not theological right that's not theological that's passion, right? yeah yeah that's 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 emotional which uh, again right. our emotions are, are are very unreliable uh and especially they're unreliable theological sources um right, right, right. And, and so i mean i think a lot of people have this kind of emotional um, uh, uh, response to this question, um, because we think, you know, that, that people, you know, have been all, you know, people have had bad things happen to them, you know, how can they really be culpable? Um, you know, and and so people get into the, you know, nobody really sees the glory of God is, I think if they did see it, you know, they would, nobody would, nobody would not choose God. You know, I've heard that before. Uh, nobody would not choose God. Um, uh, but again, you know, God asks for fidelity. And mm-hmm. if, if we see God face to face. I just can't interrupt here. Yeah. He doesn't, he doesn't ask. Oh, sorry. Right. He, he commands. Yeah. <laughs> right. right. This is actually, I think, important. I'm being nitpicky here. No, no. You, it's, it is. It, he demands, right? And rightly so, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, in terms of accepting the gospel, obviously, that's an invitation. That's something that, not something that we imposed by our own coercive force but at the same time it's not an option like i'm inviting you to my birthday party yeah right it's more like here is coming wrath and there's one life vessel to, like you know like lifeboat right, to get <laughs> out of here right? and, I, and i'm saying get on the boat right yeah <laughs> you know? and, and i you think know, and i think where people get confused is they'll say well god's love is unconditional it's like okay, well, 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 that may be the the offering of God's love is conditional, but salvation 
is conditional. Uh, uh, he, he, he gives us a way to participate in our own salvation. We have to have that ability to say yes. We have to have the ability to say no. Um, because if we didn't, again, if we didn't have the ability to say no to God, then our yes would be just meaningless and, you know, in the end we would all be saved. So, I mean, it just completely destroys any sort of concept of free will uh, in this way. And, and I think I, I, I think another thing that comes in is that um, people turn away from God all the time. You sure. know, it, it, it happens every day. Uh, uh, and if this is your if this is your disposition that you choose to live your life by, as a turning away from God, as a complete rejection of Him, uh, uh, then yeah, hell hell becomes not only a possibility but hell becomes a probability uh, right, for sure. that soul. Um, you yeah, know, I mean, the, the, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say there's a uh, I was just talking with somebody about this, and uh, there was a there was an interview with, um, and, th- and I think this will this will demonstrate kind of. If this is our disposition, hell becomes uh, a, a probable reality. This was a uh, um, an interview that Playboy did with Sololinsky, and uh, they asked uh, the Playboy asked Sololinsky about the afterlife, and he said this. He said, "If there is an afterlife, and I have anything to say about it, I will unreservedly choose to go to hell." And they said, "Why?" <laughs> they said, "Why?" He says, "Hell would be heaven for me." All my life, I've been with the have-nots. And the, he says, once I, once I get into hell, I'll start organizing the have-nots over there. And he says, why then? He's like, they're my kind of people. So, uh, words, uh, yeah. w- words that may be rude in the future. <laughs> right, yeah. So he may be enjoying his, the, 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 the wishes of his reality because, yeah, yeah. you know, um, there's that, uh, uh, what is it? I think it's in the great, the great divorce where uh, uh, there's that, there's that line where uh, C.S. Lewis says, you know, in the end, there are those that say to God, thy will be done. And those that God to say that, that God says to other, God says to people, thy will be done. Meaning Mm -hmm. that, you know, either we say to God, thy will be done, or God says to us, thy will be done. And so uh, uh, hell becomes uh, not only a possibility, but it becomes a probability it becomes mm-hmm. uh um uh something uh that is a, a a more than just a real possibility uh for some people sure i mean and that, that ties in jason directly to i think the, the cumulative case against even a soft form of universalism yeah um which you're starting with yeah uh, what you're bringing out is the doctrine of original sin we are born inclined to sin Mm-hmm. And the wages of sin is death. Yeah. And so the, um, you know, this sometimes it gets thrown up, it gets brought up. Well, no one would choose against God. Well, that's just false, right? The question, I mean, the moral, the drama of of salvation, right, mm-hmm. is not directly choosing God or not choosing God. Yeah. It's choosing this act of adultery, this act of fornication, that act of dishonesty or greed, right? Um, it's, it's not about choosing God directly or indirectly. It's about choosing to obey God. Right. And, um, uh, and to, and to follow his, his commandments. Um, so, and this is why I put the emphasis on demand, right. That, that we have an obligation to obey God. And when we don't do that, we deserve, uh, condemnation. We deserve punishment. Um, and we're inclined to disobey God. Go back to your point here, right? Yeah. The, about from original sin. So we're already inclined to do that, which will end up causing us to be damned. Yeah. Right? Does that make sense? Right? So we already begin with that as a disposition. So you should think what, you know? I mean, it, if you think about an inclination as a, uh, as an inclined plane, right? Yeah. And you release like a ball at the top of an inclined plane. Well, what's going to happen? In a well, normal gonna, gravitational yeah, situation. It's <laughs> going to follow that path, right? That's right. It's going to roll down the inclined plane. That's how we are without interruption, right? That is, if there's an intervention, right, yeah. then right, it's possible that uh, that trajectory will be stopped. But the default position, yeah. this is the key point, the default position is that we are um, rolling towards hell from birth, right? Yeah. Um, because of... Uh, original sin, right? That, that's that's the beginning point. So that means that 
um, the probability, right? It's more likely than less likely, right? That uh, all things remaining equal, that uh, 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 human beings will end up in hell. And you know, if you just even uh, you don't, uh, if you just look at say the Catechism of the Catholic Church, right? It clearly says this is the constant teaching of the Catholic Church: that anyone who dies in a state of mortal sin, unrepentant mortal sin, is going uh, goes to hell. Just, it's, it's that straightforward, right? Yeah. We can try to complicate it, but if you die in a state of unrepentant mortal sin, which is just to say, die in a state of mortal sin, then you know um, you are uh, your your fate is hell. Um, and here's the thing: is we are inclined to commit mortal sin by original sin, right? Yeah. And so we're inclined to do that very thing um, that would uh, uh, mean that we um, uh, go to hell. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. And I think, you know, I think, and this was, uh, you know, one of, one of part of the, the Balthazar's project was he was, he was really looking at kind of two different, sh uh, uh, strands of text. I think that's how he puts it, uh, uh, in sacred scripture of one that kind of points to this kind of, uh, uh, in the end, you know, all men w will be saved. Not necessarily. He doesn't make that position, but it just happens to be. You know, because he points to, to passages where Jesus says that he will, you know, draw all men to himself or, you know, so, I mean, there's these seemingly passages, passages that point to this position of, uh, of kind of all men being saved. But he does, you know, the other thing he does bring up is the, the other strand, you know, which, which he points out, you know, uh, that, you know, Matthew seven thirteen I think is probably the best one uh, sure. uh, that, that, you know, we, we enter by the narrow gate. For wide mm -hmm. is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many are mm -hmm. those who enter by it. Um, right. I mean, that's you know from the lips of our Lord right there. Sure. And I think that's yeah. you know one of the greatest indicators of the sure. the reality uh, that we're speaking uh, about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, and 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 you know the the, the church is the position of say. <clears throat> The church on hell, so it's dogmatic position. Yeah. But as, but as well as the small t, I would say traditional position that that many go to hell. In fact, probably most. Um, it grows out of those verses and reflection on those verses. Um, if you look at uh, another one that I think is uh, pretty compelling, uh, is Matthew twenty two fourteen, right, mm -hmm. where uh, you get you know sort of the many are called, but the few are chosen, right, mm -hmm. um, and and so. Wherever this, wherever there's a relevant passage, right, it seems to speak in favor of well, at least some are damned, right, <laughs> uh, right, uh, which would be the contradictory of the idea that all are saved or none are not, or that none are damned. Yeah. Um, and this is, in fact, I think the overwhelming, uh, and, and I really mean overwhelming, witness of the saints and the doctors, mm -hmm. um, you know, Saint Augustine and Saint Thomas Aquinas. Are united on this point, uh, not only that that some right are damned, but that most are damned. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Saint Thomas may be surprising for people to hear that, and I know that Robert Barron professes to be a, a Thomist of some sort, but uh, you know, Thomas is very clear, following Augustine, and I would say Saint Paul and others. But and well, anyways, I'll leave that aside. <laughs> the um, that's enough. That, <laughs> that yeah, that uh, uh, that that most most are damned and St. Thomas of course you know builds up a reasonable case based on the uh the inefficacy of nature towards that supernatural end mm -hmm. and then also the inclination uh of original sin that's inherent in us uh given that's the case most will uh not end up uh being saved and this isn't uh, uh you say like this isn't just a particularly even Western position, though. Right. There are a few Eastern fathers who hold for something uh, close to universalism. But again, even the majority of them don't, right? right. Uh, Irenaeus, Basil, Cyril, Chrysostom, all of them interpreting these passages that we're talking about, uh, Luke 13, Matthew 7, Matthew chapter 22, uh, say not just that some will be damned, but that the vast majority of the human race, mm -hmm. right? That is their that's the that is the that's the consensus patristic position, right? right? Um, uh, and certainly is the consensus scholastic position. Uh, Saint Robert Bellarmine, Doctor of the Church, Saint Gregory the Great, Doctor of the Church, uh, Saint Alphonsus Gori, Doctor of the Church, all of them 
hold that uh, uh, that interpretation. So, you know, is it possible that they're all wrong? Yeah, it's possible, right? <laughs> you know, again, uh, but, you know, at some point you start to say, well, it's really, it starts to sound really unlikely. And even saints that we hold out for their sort of pastoral, whatever exactly that means, uh, their pastoral, you know, sort of uh, bent like St. John Vianney, right? You know, St. John Vianney is like, no, nope, most people go to hell, right? I mean, yeah. he's, he's, you know, like, <laughs> you know, and, um, and and a lot of his pastoral zeal, right, is uh, inspired, right, uh, by that uh, uh, perspective. And then if you start to get, of course, even the, even the approved Catholic mystics, I mean, the, the case just gets ramped up even more. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. And, and I think, you know, for for the, <sighs> the, the Catholic today, you know, uh, that should be that should be a motivating factor. And, and I think this is kind of the case that, you know, our, our father or Bishop Barron kind of makes this case, I think, in a, in an awkward way where he says, you know, if we if we hope that all men are saved, then we need to get to work. Our hope uh-huh. needs to drive our action. Our hope needs to drive our works in evangelization you know, uh, especially to those, you know, I, I get that point, but, but I think, <laughs> or at least for me, it's a stronger motivation. <laughs> if, if I'm like, no, mo- like right now, the, the disposition to a lot of people, uh, uh, and, and even the inclinations of myself mm-hmm. are, are, are towards hell. Uh, um, if I don't repent, if I don't, you know, uh, uh, mm-hmm cooperate with the grace of god uh if i don't remain in that state uh uh, that state of sanctifying grace uh Mm -hmm. you know that become you know i think that's maybe a more appropriate motivation for the work of evangelization sure yeah i I don't know certainly historic certainly historically yeah right um you know people uh great missionary saints like um um saint um Xavier, right? The, uh, Francis uh, Xavier, uh, yeah. Francis Xavier, yeah. the Apostle of Japan. I mean, like you know, it, it was his. Um, I mean, his his conviction that most people are going to hell, right? I mean, like the the and and, and that drove his apostolic zeal, right? Yeah. Uh, to 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 participate in the uh, salvation of uh, souls. Um, so I think you know the witness here of the saints and the witness of how to interpret the scripture on this point, yeah. right, I think is overwhelmingly in the negative, yeah. right? So if you go back to those two questions I asked at the beginning, whether all are saved or whether many are saved, I think actually the the negative on both questions, right, is much stronger than uh, the affirmative, right? That is, it's not the case that all are saved and it's not the case that even many are saved, Um both the both take, again taking this case cumulatively, we're inclined towards mortal sin. Mortal sin is sufficient to send you to hell, and and the vast majority of saints and doctors of the church, and fathers of the church, uh, interpret uh, take the more sort of pessimistic, I would say realistic view of the matter. Right? Yeah. So you take all that together, you know. Again, it's like you know you've got a medical condition, right? And it all seems to be all symptoms are indicating that you have heart disease, right? And all the experts and all the signs point in that direction or say 98%, right? You say, well, there's just 2% chance that I don't have heart disease. Yeah. So I'm going to go eat, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to continue on eating barbecue for breakfast. Um, you know, like, no, right? Like that's unwise. It's imprudent. It's irrational, right? Yeah. Uh, do you have a reasonable hope that you won't die of heart disease? No, right? <laughs> if, you know, that. That's not a rational um, yeah. position. Well, and and the the example I always use is, you know, so so say you develop uh, some kind of cancer, like uh, let's see, cancer of the ear. We'll we'll go with this. Okay. Cancer, it's a rare form, but uh, uh, but it, but it turns into something rampant. Everybody, you know, like say say you you go to a doctor. The doctor says, okay, you have cancer of the ear. Uh, we have a solution. The solution is to simply cut off your ear. Uh, a new one will grow back and it'll be all better. Uh, it's, it's a sure thing. It's modern science. It's great. We've perfected it. You know, yeah. it would be unwise for the person to say, nah, I'm going to hold out on a miracle. I'm going to hold out on some <laughs> right. kind of divine intervention for, you know, uh, 
like mm-hmm. no, that would that would that would be dumb. Uh, and, and actually, that that choice in and of itself is a choice against the remedy that God has given to us. Sure. Um, you know, sure. and I think that's I think that's another point is to is to recognize that that God has given us a remedy. So for us to 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 maybe fall into a position, well, you know, I think you know if I'm if I'm a little bit merciful to God, or if I'm a little bit merciful to my fellow human being, you know, think about how much more God. God is going to be merciful to them if I forgive them, you know, their faults, or it doesn't really matter if they go to church. They're a good person. Well, you know, See, that's no. just, this is false, right? Like, yeah, you, people, <laughs> the, this is where Christians have just adopted too many false premises, right? Yeah. Um, the premise that people are good is an error, right? We are born bad. Right. That is, we are inclined towards sin and rebellion against God. It's evident yeah. in Scripture. It's the teaching of the Catholic Church. That's never changed. Right. Um, and, and yet what you find is, oh, people are basically good. False. It's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Human nature, abstractly considered, right, uh, is um, is good. Creation is good. But individual human beings yeah. in the concrete circumstances in which they're born are born. Are, are are inclined towards evil. Well, and I think that's I think that's a distinction that that that's important that is not made enough, mm-hmm. uh, because we say, well, you know, all all creation is good, all creation is made in the human likeness of God, and and in our heads, I think we make that that next jump, which is a which right. is kind of a false jump, and of saying right. that we, therefore, we the way that we act is primarily good. Right. And mm-hmm. that's that th- there's a lot of steps in between there that that don't yeah. necessarily lead up to that point. So, sure. yes, we are made in the image of the likeness of God. We are we are true. You know, or, or, I mean, we are uh, uh, the truth is that we are good in yeah. who in our creation. Right. Uh, but uh, like you said, our disposition is not to do good without right. without and, without the aid of grace. Yeah. yeah. I mean, grace. the position of St. Augustine, and St. Thomas is that. um Without grace, right? Even the good kinds of things that we do, we do for bad reasons. Yeah. Right. And so this is why Saint Augustine and Saint Thomas endorses this position uh, in his middle to late writings. Um, holds that the, the the virtues of pagans are glorious vices. Uh, <laughs> that sounds harsh, right? And Augustine yeah. got a good turn of phrase. But uh, it's it's you know he would say look it's obvious that some pagans do some good kinds of things right yeah no doubt and hey good glad right glad that there are some good kinds of things done but because of the twist in our hearts yeah um, that exists there because of original sin we do without grace we do them for bad reasons right yeah um, so I think that's that's important uh, an important false premise to get rid of. Uh, another premise, I think, to add to, to the case uh, in the negative here, right? That is that uh, that it's it's uh, it's improbable that all will be saved, or even that many will be saved, is the teaching of the Council of Florence. The teaching of the Council of Florence again dogmatically states that uh, not only actual sin, but also original sin, is sufficient uh, for condemnation. So, again, without relieving the problem of original sin. You know, you uh, uh, and and there's lots of speculation about how that can be done yeah, outside yeah. of baptism, whatever. But that's all speculative. And the prima facie position is the prima facie posi- default position. Then, for any human being, from the moment they're born, right, they're subject to hell until there's something intervenes, right? Yeah. And and that's just for original sin, right? You don't even have to bring actual sin into it. It's simply uh, original sin is sufficient on its own. Right uh, to bring about uh, the condemnation of the human person to hell. Yeah, and the church knows one means baptism, mm. and, and so Correct. it says. You know, the the church knows no other. Oh, come means. on, let's roll the dice on something else. Something else <laughs> well, exactly. Right. If the doctor, if the if the the oncologist gives you a cure for your cancer, and you're sure. to reject it. You know, you're like, you're like I've heard that. Like, if you drink right this uh, this <laughs> herbal tea, like. Uh, just at the right right time, you know, you do some essential oils. Maybe that'll work. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Right. No. No. Right. Yeah. It, I mean, so 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 it's one of those things where you know um, we've spoken about this before, you know, and you've brought up the the um, 
uh, you know, the we're still in the, the feeling the effects and still maybe even engaged in the work of emotivism, you know, of, of, of sure. being a, a main driver in a lot of in a lot of what we do. And, mm-hmm. and so f- so for the Catholic, we, we you know, I, th- I think the disposition we need to say is, you know, before we let our emotions get into it, we need to say, what is the clear teaching of Scripture? OK, we have yeah. these. Okay, so we, we have these passages that, that point to hell being a real possibility, and it seems that Scripture may say that there's people there, but then there's these other passages. Okay, that's what Scripture says. That's the te- yeah. yeah. Which ones, you know, which ones are more weighty or which ones are... That's right. Know? Yeah, I think, yeah, and which so, ones are more likely? And what and, and then, again, what is the tradition? Like, what have yeah. saints and doctors, how have they typically interpreted the matter cumulative? And typically... Right, the majority fall on the not all, not many side. Yeah, and, and yeah, like and so, I would say, yeah, that's that's our next step. What is the what is how does the sure. church interpret these passages and bring yeah. them into sure. co- to kind of a fruition mm-hmm. in their in her teaching? Um, because right. again, so so if you if you if you see that and and you study that and you say, well, you know, I still feel this way. Think about. Think about what you are doing. You you are you are setting up something you feel, which mm-hmm. you know may be nice. It may be compassionate, maybe false compassion. Um, sure. But but what what you're essentially doing is you're setting your feelings up against the constant teaching of the church. That yeah. that yeah. I think sure. it's a it's a a, a a somewhat arrogant position. Again, sure. I don't think this is the one that Balthazar is necessarily advocating he again he's engaging in speculative theology um but i but i think it's one that that our modern person even the modern catholic i think sometimes falls into uh uh and so they don't evangelize so they don't think it's important to uh to help bring others to the catholic faith um right, uh, sure. that, that that we can fall into this so we don't want to set our emotions on a higher kind of pedestal than the than the constant teaching of the church for 2000 years, meditating, reflecting on, and again, mm-hmm. people that are way more holy than I am, sure. <laughs> interpreting yeah, and know, writing uh, about these things. So you talk, you know, like uh, sometimes we talk about the, you'll hear in various debates, uh, the phrase uh, uh, employed, uh, the scientific consensus, right? The consensus yeah. of the scientific community. Yeah. Okay, fine. All right. Uh, the, the consensus of the wise and holy OK, yeah. <laughs> should also weigh deeply in the in these matters um, and their consensus is in the negative. Right. That is that not not all and not many. Um, one other thing I, I want to add to this, uh, uh, just uh, I know we, we need to kind of start wrapping up here, but there's a couple more points I think that we need to hit. One is uh, with respect to the natural law. So one one thing that happens is people will say, well, what about all those people who haven't had a sufficient opportunity to know Jesus? Are you saying that because they they don't know Jesus uh, or they haven't had the opportunity to be a Christian, therefore that they're condemned. And, and my answer to that is, is well, let's, let's be a little more detailed. Yeah. First, um, a lack of faith in Christ isn't necessarily the first or primary issue here. The first or primary issue is um, is is sin of any sort that violates the basic precepts of the natural law. Yeah. Right. So St. Thomas and others are very clear. The basic precepts of the natural law are the 10 commandments, right? Yeah. The 10 commandments are basic precepts of the natural law. They're evident, evident, let's say again, evident to human <laughs> reason. Okay? These are not things that we don't know. We yeah. know these things. They are, we are not ignorant of the basic precepts of the natural law, period. Okay. So if you commit adultery, if you commit murder, right, um, uh, if you commit idolatry, if you do any of those things, you're violating, right, the natural law, and you're worthy of condemnation for that violation. Yeah. Regardless of issues about whether or not you've known, uh, had an opportunity to know Jesus, right? The the reason, like, if you commit, I mean, let's, say, let's say, let's say, Jason, that... <laughs> Uh, you were uh, 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 an Aborigine cool. in Australia before it was discovered or whatever, found by um, I don't know the British or whoever else, but whatever, uh, some Europeans, right? And so you're down there in Australia, carrying on your Aboriginal ways, 
Um, and throughout your life, we'll also even set aside the question of idolatry, yeah. right? Um, you commit one act, right, of adultery, right? And you're not, you're not particularly sorry for it, but you don't do anything else bad for the rest of your life. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, and you die without any sort of re rejection or repenting of that one act of adultery. Yeah. Right. Logically speaking, what is the outcome for you? Hell. Hell, right. And we just like that one act, right, is is sufficient, unrepented of a key qualification. Yeah. Right. Uh, unrepented of that one act of adultery uh, is uh, sufficient for uh, eternal uh, condemnation. Yeah, and and again, I, I think for a lot of people, their emotions say, "Ah, oh, that's that sounds, you know, so harsh. That sounds so, that sounds that sounds tough, you know." But it, but again, it also reminds me of, uh, um, you know, uh, when Jesus is preaching about the Eucharist. That's a hard. Sure. That's a hard teaching, right, you know. Right, yeah. And so for the Christian, yeah. you know, to whom else shall we go? That's yeah, that's. Sure. I mean, I mean, that's that's our our, our that should be our disposition. Yeah. At some point, we have to recover the gravity of sin, right? I mean, yeah, this yeah, is yeah. the thing, and, and I think one of the problems here, and I don't want to go too far on it, but one of the problems is we have tended more and more in the 20th century uh, to define sin simply in terms of human hurts, uh, how it you know deprives us of happiness, how it deprives yeah. us of our best good, how it weakens us, uh, etc. And that's true. OK, but it's only half the story. Right. And That's maybe not even. Side. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe not even though the most important half, the, the it's an offense against God. Yeah. Right. It doesn't harm God. Right. God can't be harmed by it. But it does mean that we're not giving what is due to God, which is our perfect obedience. Um, and so um, it's it's a contrary to God's authority, uh, God's majesty, God's uh, role as creator and Lord. Uh, and so, uh, part of this, you know, the gravity issue, this is, comes up in St. Anselm, St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas, part of the gravity of sin is realizing the person who is offended, yeah. right? It's not just about you hurting your own psyche. It is about that, but it's also about you, uh, basically rejecting God's authority over you. Right. Yeah. And, and because of the dignity of the person offended there, um, uh, it deserves, it's an infinite fault, right? Yeah. And therefore it deserves an unending um, uh, punishment. Yeah, and I think that's a part that a lot of people forget. And, and this is why we have trouble uh, um, putting together sins like murder and missing mass on Sunday. Well, people say, well, how, do you, how, do, how are they both deserving of you know, eternal punishment? Well, a lot, it's not necessarily... Um, uh, or, or the the part that we forget about the act of that sin is the one mm -hmm. whom we are offending. That is right. that's that's mm -hmm. huge. That that plays right, a huge right, part right. In, in in what it is uh, uh, that that we do, and so it mm -hmm. carries a heavy. You know, and, and we have this on you know like we have this on a, 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 a on a natural level. So, Doctor Smith, if I punch you in the face, I think that's like simple assault or something like that. <laughs> Not that big of a deal. But if I punch uh, like the president in the face, that becomes uh, like a, a felony and I go sure, to prison. Sure. Why? Because of the dignity of the office. Because of the dignity well, of the yeah, office. Yeah, it's yeah. the same, you know, according to our emotions and eyes, it looks like the same offense, but it is wholly different because sure. of, of who yeah. I'm attacking. Right. Yeah, and, and this isn't exactly parallel, but I think it's, uh, it's a little bit illustrative. I mean, imagine that you were to see a, uh, uh, a young man assaulting an older man and um, – and he was a stranger. Well, you would say that's bad, right? You shouldn't yeah. be doing that. But then you find out that it's not a stranger; it's his father, Ooh, right? Yeah. Or his grandfather. Like you're like, what? Oh, like there's something worse here, right? Like, like we recognize there's a kind of even deeper offense, right? Sure. sure. Uh, one of the reasons being that we owe piety after God and country. We owe piety to our parents. Yeah. Um, and so uh, um, there is again the dignity of the office, right? Uh, th that's involved. So another issue here, just another plank, right? I think in the case against the uh, the for all, uh, or sorry, against the um, uh, that all will be saved or many will be saved, is the reality of the natural law that the natural law is evident, right? That it consists of the Ten Commandments, and that any um, uh, grave and voluntary violation of the Ten Commandments 
is worthy of uh, hell, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, just that, right? You think, man, the Ten Commandments, you know, am I, you know, you could say, oh, I'm a good person. I mean, the quickest one to say is, have you ever lied? <laughs> well, or the or the first three commandments that have to do with God. The first right, three. Right, 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 I mean, that, yeah. that sometimes I think people, when people talk about, you know, the commandments being uh, 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 an expression of natural law, uh, uh, we just think of like the last seven, you right, know, or the right. last six, you right, know, sure, sure. you know, but That's we can't, point. we can't forget, you know, the first three. And again, again, our first, our first duty, our first, uh, um, mm. uh, place of devotion is to God. Um, right. sure. um and sure. so, so, you know, St. Augustine, I've said this before, St. Augustine said, you know, what, what, uh, man ceased to read on his heart, God wrote on the tablets. Uh, um, sure. it's written there. Uh, we know it, we, you know, another way to say, it, you know, there's a book, uh, what we can't not know, uh, <laughs> you know, all about yeah, natural yeah, law. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh yeah. It, it's there. Uh, and, and again, this, this whole judgment thing is not just, you know, uh, uh, we can't just say, well, you know, God, we can't say that, you know, God reveals things to us, but we have to say something like, you know, our response to God and who he is, is, is very important. Uh, Absolutely. Um, and so that response in however it is, like you had said about the Aboriginal uh, person or something like that, uh, our, our response to God uh, uh, has eternal effects. Sure. You know, yeah, and, and that's where and, and we're not because of original sin and then later because of personal sin, we're not always inclined to respond in that way. And that's why we need that intervention. We need God's grace uh, and we need those things. And so. Mm. I think for Catholics, that should be our disposition, and that should sure. also be our motivation to, to, to pray with our families, form our children, uh, um, uh, look at those that God has put into our life. You know, when we're always, you know, looking for, you know, well, you know, who should I evangelize? Well, look at the ones that God's already put into your care, sure. your <laughs> right, kids, right, right, you know, right. your, your mother, your father, your right. son, you know, mm -hmm. grandparents, mm -hmm. your grandkids, your kids. You know, it's never, it's never too late for us to constantly be reaching out uh, because, again, you know, the— the church has never said that a particular person is in hell. So, you know, th there is that, but, but hell is a very real reality. Uh, yeah. uh, and like we had talked about here, that the, the probability uh, mm -hmm. that many end up there is very yeah. high. Yeah. And so we should reach out to those that God has placed into our care uh, uh, to help bring them to the, the, the fullness of life and also uh, uh, to help them respond to God because it doesn't always come natural. We're inclined sure. to something else. We need right. we need yeah. that help. Yeah. We need that community. Yeah, in that way. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I would say you know, just wrapping up here on a practical point here. If you think of um, the uh, the question at the outset, right, whether all or whether many, I think you know it's improbable to say either of those things. Mm -hmm. It's probable to say neg to be in the negative on both of those questions. And then that should affect, right, our uh, dispositions here and how we think about apostolate, how we think about evangelization, like you were talking about. And you think, well, you know, that if if it's the case, right, uh, that it's improbable these things are, are – that it's improbable that all go to he uh, heaven and it's improbable that even many go to heaven, then I think what you want – like the, the old way of putting this is that we have a practical certainty that most are on their way to hell. Right. And uh, that's not a theoretical certainty. Right. So it's yeah. not a speculative certainty, but it's a practical certainty. Yep. Practical certainty is sufficient to uh, ground action. Yep. Right. So when you're choosing a spouse and choosing a spouse, say, uh, in a virtuous manner, you never achieve theoretical certainty that that person's going to be a, a good spouse. Right. <laughs> but you are expected to, to uh, achieve a certain practical certainty sure. sufficient to act upon it. And so I think that, that if we came to the practical conviction as a church, that most people are on their way to hell, then we should act like it, <laughs> right? Yeah. And 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 you know, and when you think about sort of our relative investment of resources and time and energy, let me just ask you: Is an eternal good greater than a temporal good? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Period. Yeah. Is it is, is, it, is an eternal <laughs> is an eternal yeah is eternal pain worse? than temporal pain absolutely period full stop <laughs> right. like, so where we need to be putting our our emphasis yeah right radically so right is obviously on these uh eternal outcomes yeah and again it's very because of who we are in our fallen nature it's very easy for our emotions to 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 take over when it comes mm -hmm. to this realm of eternity i mean that's 
for us that's it's it's almost incomprehensible um but we shouldn't l allow our emotions to overrule reason to mm -hmm. overrule sacred scripture to overrule the constant teaching of the church in humility we should submit our intellect we should submit uh, our kind of uh, 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 our emotions uh, to what God has revealed uh, uh, in sacred scripture and in the constant teaching of the church. So, Dr. Smith, I want to thank you uh, for joining us in this in this interesting conversation. I'm sure it's one that'll that'll continue to be in um, uh, uh, in the news, in the blogs, in the, the the web space out there. And so, I want to invite all our listeners again. Check us out at CatholicStudiesAcademy.com. Until next time, God bless.